All right. Hey, everybody, this is Brian Johnson with Canopy Management, and welcome today. I've got a special treat for you because I have uh, invited um, uh, some associates of ours that have to going to come on and give you something, some new insights that you may not have considered. This is part of a series that we're doing right now of trying to get you out of the Amazon tiny little box that you might be in. And this, I can't think of any better way to kick this off with uh, than with the Bluebird Group. So today I am welcoming Jason Kapsner and forgive me if I you know, correct me if I'm going to pronounce your names uh, correctly or incorrectly, but I'm going to go with Jason Kapsner and Tom Woolen. Is that about right? Perfect. Nailed it. Okay. Cool. And these guys are from the Bluebird Group. Now, uh, as far as who the Blue Bluebird Group is, if I can say it correctly, uh, they have had quite the accomplishment. They've they've been able to help emerging startup brands up to big time category players. Uh, to make that smooth transition that I know some of you want to make from digital, i.e. Amazon focused, over to the brick and mortar store shelves like Target, Walmart, Costco, number of chains that are appropriate for your type of product. So I wanted them to come in and kind of uh, run through as far as like, what does that actually look like? Hopefully try to use uh, terms that uh, each of you can understand well. And if not, we'll get your question answered as well. So if you're curious about how to massively increase your revenue beyond digital, beyond uh, e-commerce, beyond Amazon specifically, you're in the right place. So stay tuned. Let me go ahead and hand it over. Fire away, Tom. Or Jason, whoever's presenting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> Oh, thanks so much, Brian, for having us. We're really excited to, excited to be here. And, and this topic is one that's very passionate uh, to us. And um, so many of our brands that we engage with fit, fit, have been in these exact shoes. Of, I think some of the people on this, on this call, so we're, we're excited to be here. A um, quick background on myself. Uh, so Jason Kapsner, uh, founder and CEO of Bluebird. Um, I have been in this uh, in this retail services space here based out of Minneapolis, uh, where we have the, you know, the, the, the frozen tundra, which is not a great place to be in January, but um, but we do have two great retailers here in Target and Best Buy that has led me to be here for for in this business of retail services for you know about 24 years now. So I'm kind of feeling like I'm the old man in the room now in the in the space, uh, which which is sort of new. But uh, that's a bit about me, Tom. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everybody. Tom Woolen, CMO at Bluebird. Uh, started my career in modern retail, um, coming up through Best Buy, but. Spent seven beautiful years at Amazon out in Seattle and got to know a lot of the one piece out of the business, kind of departed as my last role of DMM. Uh, went to a retail intelligence company you may be familiar with called Stackline that specialized in a lot of the ways brands need to assess their digital retail health and, and since grown into a lot of the intelligence space, then came to Bluebird to help modernize our approach. And also a lot of you familiar with the number of ways you can inject science into the art of re retail success. And, and my goal in being here at Bluebird is to take all the great work that Jason and his team um, have built with their access to retailers like Target and Best Buy and find new ways to take interesting data points and make those stories strong for our brands and retailers. So today we have a pretty a pretty tight um, but impactful agenda we think here. So briefly, we're going to talk to you a little bit about Bluebird, so you kind of know who we are, what we do, um, but more importantly, answer answer these questions of that I think a lot of you are facing, which is should I go to omnichannel uh, retail at this point, and if that, and we're going to take you through some criteria and some of our thoughts of um, on that on that topic, and then secondarily, if the answer is yes, well, how do I do it, and what does that look like? Um, and, uh, and we're going to, you know, we're going to stay pretty high level. We're going to get a little in the weeds, but, um, if there's obviously questions that come up here at the end or whatever, you know, point here, feel free to inject and ask those questions as we go here. Um, so briefly, um, about Bluebird. So we are a group comprised of about 85 people. Most of the, the, the group here that work here have, have been servicing retail, but a lot of us have come out of buying different buying roles and different, um, you know, stops in our career at one of these retailers that you're looking at um, on the screen here. So the current retail base that we really focus on is Target, Best Buy, Walmart, and Costco. And I think there's there's a lot of people that do, um, you know, whether you call us brokers, reps, whatever you, that might be, uh, that do this in, in, in our town and, and across these different channels. And I, and I think the thing that makes us unique and why we're so passionate about this call is if, if, these retailers would probably, if they had to kind of answer what makes Bluebird different, um, it, it's really what our what we focus on is 
finding brands or white space opportunities and categories and bringing those to these retailers. And that's why these retailers lean into our teams and us uh, pretty heavily is to go find those brands. And, and we have a track record of, of doing that um, pretty deeply of finding D to, and really what that, what those brands that resonate right now at retail, um, which is a perfect um, <laughs> for this conversation are brands that have really developed significance in the D to C channel, you know, digitally or on Amazon. Um, and so when Brian called us up and said, hey, would you be interested in, in, in having a webinar like this? It, it, it's a perfect fit for us. And so, you know, currently today, if we work with over 200 brands um, selling to that retailer base that we just just showed you. And we, we picked some some unique brands here. You know, we service brands that really run the scale of, you know, pretty early stage to as large as, you know, our largest client is Google. So we've got a, a deep partnership with Google and the Google hardware team, um, you know, so a pretty scan, we, we run a pretty large gamut there of size of, of brands, but you either really say like our team and our passion is finding these brands that fit this profile of I'm winning in a digital space, but I'm, I'm starting to, I, I need more growth and I need more opportunity and I need to look in the brick and mortar, brick and mortar space. And some of these brands here, you know, all, most of these brands fit that profile. Um, exactly. I mean, Therabody is a big partner of us and we started with them. Um, they were exclusively a D2C brand at the time um, and grew into a pretty large supplier now, but probably the poster child for a lot of you Amazonians out there is Anchor. Um, we actually have them in our office right now, um, but uh this, the anchor business, which is a pretty well documented business, was one that grew exclusively on the Amazon side of things, and they're over a billion dollar brand globally right now. And that's a group that we launched in Omni Channel Retail with, really primarily starting off with Target and Best Buy and Walmart. So, um, really proud of some of the work that we've done there. To you know, and and they're each one of these brands has a very unique story of uh, and pathway and entrance into the into the retail environment that we've worked with. So. Um, and that when we work with brands, it's, you know, from category segments, from everything from beauty, sporting goods, food, electronics, you know, it, it kind of fits a lot of different uh, segments of what we have built teams um, that are dedicated into each one of those kind of categories across you know, a retailer like Target and Walmart in this example. Obviously, Best Buy is a pretty electronics focused retailer in that, in that sense. Um, and just real quick on our capabilities, what I kind of wanted to highlight here is what we have done is built capabilities that mirror what the retailer, or really what the retailer expects a brand to bring to them. Um, so as you're a brand approaching retail, we've built out our teams to be and strategies to be able to, to address those, those needs that the retailer expects from a brand. So from a sales strategy perspective, it's you know, category development, identifying that white space, um, you know, putting developing unique growth plans that fit both what the retailer is looking for. And that's where we lean on our team to have those relationships to know exactly what uh, the retailer is looking for in said category. Um, and you're going to hear something here as we continue to go, like relationships really matter um, in this space, which is very differentiated probably for those that are dealing in the Amazon space where relationships aren't as important. Um, and, uh, you know, promotional planning, joint business planning, all those kind of pieces too. Secondarily, planning and operations, just like, um, for Amazon has very unique sets of um, operational components that they expect of the, of the vendor. Each one of these retailers that I mentioned have their own order management system, in-stock analysis tools that they're looking at. And so developing a team that has real deep knowledge of those, those direct systems and, and how to manage through those things is something that we've, we've developed as, as a part of those that group of 85. Um, and then there's the account management pieces here that you can see item setup, maintenance, detailed reporting, PDP management, you know, a lot of those pieces that um, you're doing today in your, in your categories. Um, and then maybe these, these last couple here are, are more significant to, you know, kind of signify what you guys are doing uh, in the digital side of things, but the digital insights piece of so channel insights, traffic analysis, uh, consumer behavior, um, D to C search trends and a lot of the benchmarking components that go into that, as well as demand gen, which is something that obviously um, you spend a lot of time doing on the Amazon side to, to get that right from retail media, budget recommendations, strategic planning, um, all those different kind of pieces. So we've so developed our, to, our, yeah. I'm gonna throw a curveball at you here periodically. So I uh, hope you don't mind. Do. <laughs> uh, love it, love it, please do. One of the things that, uh, that I make sure that it, within our own company, within Canopy is that we make sure that we recognize what our, you know, we, we've got a lot of capabilities, but we identify just like three superpowers that we consider as like, you know what, if, 
if you're going to pick anybody, you've got to pick us for this particular thing. So from kind of your capabilities, what would you, what would you claim as your superpower? Our superpower is, I, I would say, is access and execution. So access is really important. Yeah. And that seems... And that access to, to the access, retail groups? Access to the retail, to the, to the retail teams. And okay. there's a lot of, and, and that may seem sort of simple and basic and say, well, don't we all have access to, can't, can I just send an email to a buyer and, and they'll respond to me? And the answer to that is often no, they won't. Because no. they're well, we learned busy. that from Shark Tank, right? You know, they, they, it's yeah, like, well, right. I've got my contacts, and it was like everybody's got those contacts. Like, yeah, but they were they return my phone call. <laughs> so. and, yeah, and so we we I kind of live by a saying ourselves and with our team is we have to earn the right to be heard. Um, and so what that means for us is that you know we are not just throwing things against the wall against these buyers to say, hey, you want to buy this? You want to buy this? You want to buy this? You know, we're very strategic in nature. So when I when I say the access, there's a lot that goes behind that word access, why we're granted access with these teams, because we have strategically approached them. Of we spend the time understanding their strategies, what's on their shelf, doing the research with our digital tools to understand um, where the digital marketplace sits and and where maybe some of their existing brands you know, are failing and where there's better opportunities. So as we sit with retail management, we've earned that right to be heard by, you know, frankly, you know, 20 years of, of, of earning that right by, by not just by, by treating them right and, and focusing on both the growth and development of our vendor partners that we're working with, but also the growth and development of our retail partners and putting that in focus. So I'd say that's kind of our superpower. And that's, I don't know how specific that is, Brian. No, no, that uh, is fantastic. That is awesome. I knew I was kind of throwing something out that you guys hadn't prepared for. So I appreciate you uh, just jumping in because usually it is the first thing that comes to mind. It's like, you know what? Nobody's going to beat us on this one thing, you know? Yep. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, I know I'm, I'm very passionate about making sure that people know our three, I'm not going to mention them now, but our three superpowers that we focus in, even though we might have 50 different things we can do. Right. Uh, so thank you very much on that. Okay. So I'll grab it from here if Jason doesn't mind. Yeah. Um, so the next question that I think, you know, kind of is the meat of why we're here today is, is, is retail for me? Is omni-channel for me? I'm a brand. I feel like I'm at that decision pivot point. And so we wanted to start the conversation on, of how would we think through it together side by side uh, with businesses like this? The, the biggest question that I think, you know, we need to start is what's the addressable market? Right? We live in a world in 2022 where there's so much modernization of how consumers can transact. There's so much discussion around Amazon and, and marketplaces alike Amazon and, and how large they are. Um, what gets lost in that is how large everything else traditional consumption still is. Right. So we all have our, our stats that we like to point to. I think anything that you find will be a flavor of this, you know, but but e-commerce as a percent of total sales in 2021, it grew. It definitely was up 14.2 percent. You know, it sits just south of 20 percent of all U.S. consumer sales. Inverting that, it says it's 80 percent of all U.S. consumer sales were, were done outside of traditional e-commerce. And, and so whatever flavor of stat you, you believe in is Bible, plus or minus 5% of that is still a very, very large number. There is a lot of consumers for a lot of reasons we'll talk about will, will choose to engage with a non-DTC solution, with a non-digitally native retailer. And there's still very much a place for both, right? And, and I think if you think about 80% of any given market, the next data point people point to is, well, is it growing or not growing? And our response to that is physical store growth last year in 2021, or sorry, by 2025, is, is still gonna be growing at 3% a year. Now, 3% is likely not gonna wow anybody on this call, but remind yourself the size of the business we're discussing. Um, some stats I've seen recently is the US consumer sales market's as big as $600 billion annually. 3% growth on 600 billion, you know, it's still a sizable number. And so it's our jobs to be stewards of retailers that still have a very healthy um, kind of physical operation. We at Bluebird are um, excited that the retailers that we engage with have, have modernized some of their tools in which they, they sell and they deliver customer experience and brand experience. 
which I'll talk about next. Uh, but this business is still very, very healthy. Um, and there's still very, very uh, deep amount of focus on consumers that want to shop in this way. Well, how are they doing it is the next question, right? And, and we're not trying to be overly simple, but we believe there's kind of six distinct ways omni-channel retailers or traditional retailers have kind of renewed energy around them. You know, one, they've accelerated fulfillment. So Amazon, Amazon Prime, even when it was just a two-day delivery solution was, was groundbreaking. Being able to get my products fast on time uh, was, was a very big benefit to people. Um, other retailers have taken that seriously and have found ways to do it their way. Uh, certainly one of the biggest benefits they've had is this idea that as part of your daily journey, um, you can shop online and just pick it up, right? And that in itself, for those that might feel like that's a very organic trait, is nuanced over the last three to five years to be able to work uh, a purchase into that journey and have it feel organic to your life beyond just a package being delivered at your door. They've really worked hard to expand their selection, right? When you think about why on Amazon, you know you're going to find everything. Well, a lot of retailers that used to be confined to what they can fit on a shelf. And, and retailers have really taken seriously this idea of how do we engage with more brands in more ways so a consumer has a, a parity shopability like they might find on an expansive marketplace. Service. So a lot of these retailers, especially Best Buy, have really taken akin to think about Geek Squad as a supplemental experience offering that maybe or maybe not a digital, digital only retailer or marketplace can't provide um, or can't provide as well. And they've really found a way to differentiate themselves on, on, on situations like that. Store count access, this one's pretty linear. There's still a lot of storefronts out there, right? So this is kind of making it even more um, elementary in nature. There's a lot of doors that are located in the right spots that make it very easy for people to shop um, just as they can on their phone into their front door. They've created really great brand partnerships. Brands really value, um, especially the Walmart, Costco, Target, Best Buy, Home Depots of the world that want to position brands. They want to. They want brands to mean something, and they and they really appreciate that that opportunity to tell a story both in store and online. And they've really done a good job of building kind of loyalty and retention programs that give people a reason like Prime and Prime's ecosystem um, to stay loyal. Jason, from your experience, as you think about this list, is, is there something you'd want to highlight as as like a key differentiator that you've seen in the in the recent years? Yeah, I would definitely say number one here. So accelerated fulfillment. Um, I mean, ultimately, we think right now where this retail game sits is all of our jobs and retailers' jobs is to to get the consumer the product where, how, and when they want. But that is that is a, a very important game that's being played out. Um, at retail right now. And I think COVID certainly accelerated that. And so where our omni-channel retailers are really winning is, is providing such a breadth of flex fulfillment from, you know, great, I can buy online and have it show up. I can, you know, I can buy online, go pick up in store. I can have it delivered to my car outside the store. I can walk in the store. It's going to be pre-purchased and I can just pick it up. And so all the flex fulfillment options are really important. And that's where our brick and mortar retailers are really winning. So for us, we have so many of our direct, some of our bigger direct to consumer brands. This is where they really are losing out um, in that, in, in that engagement of, you know, if you don't have the supply chain um, capabilities versus what these omni-channel retailers can provide you, um, the consumer just expects things in a flexible way of how they're going to receive the product. Sure. Yeah. Usually they want it now also too. So the, yeah. Yeah. The level of instant right. gratification is, um, has been elevated significantly by companies like Amazon for sure. Yeah. Yep. And, and Brian, I think to that point, what gets lost sight is this fulfillment simply means fast. Fulfillment means options. Like consumers just want choices. They, 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 they want to know that if they're going on vacation for a week, if it's going to be delivered on the doorstep for six days, that's, that's not exactly what the desired experience is. And so I think there's more speed delivery was, was everything for a long time. Right. And I think that's become table stakes. And then, then the revision of that um, is, is kind of the next phase. So well, and I also look at it from a standpoint of just like, as far as my own consumer behavior, if I'm in a store and I'm buying something, a lot of times, you know, 80% of their stock is not, is online. It's not even in store, for instance, but if there happens to be one item that's close enough to what I'm going to look for, it may not be the perfect solution, but I want it now. I'm going to buy it right there because I, I need to use it today 
as opposed to waiting two or three more days in order to get it online. So that's how impatient I've gone is I will actually even reduce my standard of the feature set that I'm looking for simply because it's the one thing that's right in front of me right now. Right. Exactly. Well, and, and I think you think of um, retail as like Walmart and Target, you know, grocery as a category in itself, that there's so much of that purchase experiment that is um, today, tonight, now, um, that once they're going to those retailers that frequently for something like food and Bev, they're naturally in the shopping ecosystem for anything else that exists in the box. And so um, that may or may not be the same as you think about ways kind of digitally native marketplaces serve you. But, but again, Amazon's doing a good job to solve that. If you, if you think about, okay, how do I know it's my time? You know, this slide I will tell you does a, a, an attempt to make a very complex situation simple. And we have three things on each side of the should I or shouldn't I, but, but no, it's a lot more complex than this, but these are three we wanna highlight. So the first one is, is you know, why you should, right? Product demand, but you have challenging financials. And so you are seeing significant growth. There's interest in your product. However metric you choose to measure that be through traditional upper funnel metrics or lower funnel conversion through data you get from marketplace platforms or retail, there is true demand. You are seeing sales grow. You are seeing people interested in engaging, but you have challenging financials because you're unique to one channel, right? We tell brands here, you never want to be deleveraged by having one proof point of success. And so we want to make sure that if you feel like it's time because you have a product with heat, um, if you feel like you're having constrained margins or you feel like you're starting to cap out on, on retail revenue, it may be time to start thinking about the, the vast array of consumer touch points. If you're operationally advanced, so one of the things I, I would expect, you know, your experiences with Canopy to be is the hyper focus on operational efficiency, especially as the demands of Amazon only continue to get more and more strenuous. If you feel like you have mastered that, not saying the experience with omnichannel retailers will be the exact same, but the intensity of the, of the complexity, if you will, will be, will be similar. Um, and so your ability to, to kind of dissect those things, move boxes in an efficient, effective way that doesn't put burden on your overall operations um, is a good sign. And then lastly, if, if you don't lack kind of traffic building effectiveness, right? So if you if you feel like um, you can do it on your own. You, you may not need to go to retail, but if you feel like you're having a hard time building your own unique audience and, and it's only um, being done on a retailer site through programmatic media or through lower level search retail media, if you're reliant on that, that that's fine. Um, but I don't think it's time to um, create another point where you're reliant. I think you should take um, the upper funnel process seriously to the point where you can you can be independent and drive engagement. Um, and, and certainly we feel like you never want to be um, kind of deleveraged and finding kind of necessity to partner. If you feel like you're unsure, it probably looks like one of these three things, but certainly again, these are just three highlights, is if you feel like your growth is DTC growth or Amazon growth or marketplace growth is satisfactory. So pretty linear. If you feel like you're growing and you're growing at a healthy rate and you're able to move through your go-to-market strategies efficiently and effectively, and you have yet to say what else is out there, don't go yet because you might be able to keep yourself focused and make the business bigger. Why we say that is Jason mentioned a little bit earlier, but Walmart, Target, Best Buy, anybody, the list you want to think about, they're looking at digital proof points like your success on DTC, like your success on Amazon. They will expect those businesses to be direct points of success and, and sizable, right? So if you feel like um, you haven't gotten to that iceberg and the business is, is not yet um, something that you would want to say, we, you should engage with us because we are XX million dollars, kind of wait. Um, if you're unable to manage channel conflicts, and so we obviously know, uh, I'm sure Canopy knows it better than us, is Amazon's going to be the ultimate um, kind of uh, kind of mirror, right? The market will will see your product, will see the reviews, will see the pricing of it. Um, and if we feel like that's not in a great place, you know, retailers are again just going to mirror that experience. They're going to expect the same pricing. They're going to expect the same availability. And if if all of those inner workings around channel conflicts aren't ironed out, it's going to be a compounding problem. And the last one is you've just started on DTC or Amazon or anywhere, right? Like. We also want to be very good stewards of brands that, you know, let's work through the growing pains. Let's do the basics right. 
Um, we exist because it's complex to go to, to go to omni channel. And, and we certainly feel like inventors, creators, CEOs, brand managers have so much work to do to, to make a product and make a brand that consumers care about that focus on that and, and, and focus on this idea that you can't out assort or out market an unfavorable product. And, and so if you feel like you've yet to really master the idea of, of, of enjoying what you've built, um, let's be patient before we, we take that next step. So we've gone briefly through, like, should I, right? Not answering all the questions you've had. There's certainly layers of it, but let's assume you've said, yep, I, I checked those three boxes or I think of new boxes why I should. So let's take a little bit and talk about how do we do it, right? Jason mentioned at the forefront, the biggest unique experience between a digital only marketplace or a DTC channel versus an omni-channel experience. And, and this is generally speaking, but it, it's rightfully true is, you have, a, you have less of an ability to be self-sufficient to ultimately gain the PDP placement, to gain a right to be on bestbuy.com or target.com. You need access and that access needs to be built through human capital. So we need to have national account managers that know how Best Buy works. We need to have sales teams that know how to work with third-party providers like a Bluebird to extend in. And you have to be able to um, reduce reliance on your own physical ability to manage like an Amazon FBA with a canopy that has no uh, Amazon stakeholders, generally speaking, involved to a place where it's, it's very human capital intense. And so the first step is if you don't have that competency internal to your organization, you either need to hire into it or find a third party provider. People ask all the time to us, do we feel like this is going to evolve into change? And I think we're pretty confident at Bluebird um, for a lot of reasons. It's, it's not just because of how core that operating kind of buyer engagement or, or, or retail leader engagement is to what gets selected on the shelf and ultimately what, what a retailer stands behind. We wanna give this example in plain speak. And so what we're hoping to model out here is the journey from which you start as an interested brand to what it takes to finally get to, let's just call it full scale engagement with a retailer, right? So the start of this journey is you just raising your hand saying, I wanna do business at Target as the example. What the process looks like at Target, and there's flavors of this everywhere else is, first step, as I mentioned, that brand needs to find a way to engage and get access to the retailer. You've got a really great, um, a uh, piece of hardware that you want the tools team at Target to take seriously. You have to know who should I talk to or who can I talk to about this um, through one of those kind of paths that may be non-traditional. Most brands, and this is not all because even we have examples where they didn't have to go through this sequence, but most brands, once you have access to somebody and they approve, they approve for you to go be a part of their their ecosystem is you have to ma master the digital side of it. So you're, you're a digital only SKU at some point, and you're gonna have to show strong traffic, strong retail media performance, strong availability, and, and early signs of sell through before you go to them and make the larger case. Most of these retailers have a very similar mix of in-store to dot-com sales as US consumer sales. So 80, 70 to 80% still being done by way of a in-store fulfillment uh, purchase. And so before a buyer goes and puts a, a product on a physical shelf, they wanna see as much of a sign of confidence as possible. How they do that is they say, we are going to make decisions about what, want, what should go into our store 12 to 18 months out, right? So our teams right now at Bluebird are, are talking to Target about products that will be on shelf in 2023, 2024. Right, So you have to spend some time working well in advance to get them to see the, the viability in your product. And then ultimately, they only as a corporation will put new products on the shelf two to three times a year. Right, So you have to play a long game here that maybe you don't in an instant gratification. Moving us along, once you get an award, if they say we want you to be on our shelves, they're likely going to launch you on a smaller subset. So it's a very long game here that gets played, which is we love you. We want to put you in 300 of our 4,000 stores. And so from there, you graduate out and show success. The last thing I'll say is the ongoing management. So, you know, 
Canopy and the Canopy partners, they exist because once you're on Amazon, it takes a village of tasks to be successful and it's ever changing. Same thing at Omnichannel Retail. There's just a lot more. And this next slide illustrates that. It illustrates this idea that it doesn't mean that it's less complex. It just means there's less steps and you're much quicker on a marketplace or an Amazon or your own DTC shelf to making your product purchasable than, than maybe where you are. And so we specialize in that long game. We specialize in coaching brands over time, how to think about those steps, but they are real and they are critical to ultimately reaching the largest addressable market, which is you know, being on all shelves and being on end caps and, and things that ultimately get you guys uh, you know, purchased over time. Yeah, it does definitely sound like it's a it's a pretty good commitment that you have to have some kind of established track record and be prepared. Like, can you ramp up, you know, a production? Because I certainly have uh, have a number of friends that have gone into who, who have been on whether it is uh, they've been featured on some daytime TV shows or they've been picked up for sample by Costco as an example, which I think is kind of your point. Yeah. Costco is a pretty easy one because typically it's going to be you're going to see an entire palette of something that's new and cool and then you never see it again. Right. which means the sell through wasn't there. I happen to have worked for, for Costco for a number of years uh, back in the day. And I always recall, uh, it's like, man, that was the greatest product ever. It's like, yeah, but it didn't meet the minimum velocity in order to, to reorder for a greater number of warehouses. And it's like, it's like, wow, it seemed like it sold, but it's like, it didn't sell fast enough depending on what that retailer or wholesaler is. Exactly. The, the nice yeah. part about it, though, that I would add is similar to your Costco example is when it's working, when, when you find the right formula for success, most retailers don't want infinite selection. They, they don't want to have 30, 40, 50 kind of of the same product anywhere in their ecosystem. They, they just physically and operationally don't feel like that makes sense for them. And so the flip side of today's modern retailers that are taking on kind of infinite product selection, you know, you get to capitalize on a large percent of a large addressable market if you do it well. And so, you know, that's the really why people go, why do I go through 12 to 18 to 24 months of, 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 of a process? It's you're working towards being, you know, one of a handful or one of, you know, a dozen preferred partners and a dozen is probably on the high side. And so you really can, can capture a significant amount of sales growth um, if you were effectively to move through the entire process, you know, over time. If you think about how different they are, which is, which is kind of our final slide is we want to end with, if you've mastered Amazon or you've mastered DTC, or you feel really good about the strategies, a partner like Canopy have, have educated and deployed for you, you're actually not that far away from, from being familiar with the general things you have to do. And this, this slide ultimately works to demonstrate that is if you think about Amazon, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, Costco, and you see the, the things that you'll have to be able to and the functions you'll have to be able to master and be aware of, not too dissimilar, right? So all retailers have financial requirements. You know, Amazon FBA has a rev share. They've got some fees related to storage and, and storage aging. Um, they've got, you know, a requirement to, to fund programs in certain ways. All retailers do, right? It's just what is their version of that? You think about chargeback expectations. So we highlight this one because, you know, operational excellence is only getting more and more um, pushed onto the brands. Every retailer has their version of kind of brand um, fiscal penalty, if you will, not to be punitive for not being able to operate within their standards. Retail media, super fun one for those that are deep in the Amazon or even the, S, the paid media side on Google or social, right? There is a component through different ad tech partners where you can demand gen yourself, right? You can run sponsored ads. You can do a dynamic keyword targeting. Again, they run through Citrus or Critio or other internal platforms like Walmart Connect. But, but you are probably going to be um, aware of why that's important to running a business. They all have a marketplace. They're all not connected, right, between their first party and third party. And so outside of Costco, that doesn't necessarily have a, a formal marketplace. Even those that do like Best Buy and Target, there isn't this internal alignment between the two that everybody has the best of intentions, you know, but ultimately, if you do want to 
you know, present your product to the ultimate decision maker, success on Target Plus, as an example, doesn't always translate to immediate Target 1P. And so you, you can't just say, well, I, I, I was approved to be on Target Marketplace, so that's all I have to do. Somebody will, will see me, find me, love me. And <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's not as linear as that, but we all, you always- Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Magically, it'll all suddenly just work. Correct. Correct. I will say on that side, we, we really value Target's commitment to growing selection by way of, of inviting brands, it's an invitation only program to their Target Plus network. Um, but ultimately, for it to be seamless, it's, it's got to be connected between the two and, and almost used as a, as, a, as a finding ground for the first party teams to find new and engaging things, which just isn't quite there yet. And the last thing we highlighted, we highlighted this a lot, is, is the human interaction required. And I think this is a good point to remind ourselves or those that join late. We, are, we do not believe you can run Amazon and do nothing. We believe it's a highly intense, extremely complex. Um, but what we mean by this is a lot of the work that you want to get done outside of maybe um, ticket management or brand registry issues, you, know, you as a user have the tools to go access those issues and attempt to solve them and control your own destiny, if you will the rest of the platforms are just not there yet. There needs to be people on your team or your side or like Bluebird or others that do what Bluebird does that solve those problems for you by way of engagement with retailers. And so I think this is the slide that we hope the group goes. I'm certainly um, familiar with what it might take to be successful. I, I maybe have to come to terms with the fact that it looks more like Amazon 1P than it does 3P, or looks more like, um, you know, it doesn't look as much like my, my DTC own my own journey as, as I like it to be, um, but it ultimately still does have some differentiation around the access points. And so we hope that, that this is a good, uh, I can do it slide for everybody, but certainly there's some, some things we have to solve, you know, just under this. No, and I really do appreciate the fact that you've also covered the, uh, am I ready? You know, yeah. like, am I at the point where, where I or my products, because I certainly know that it's not, it, uh, it's a mix of both, uh, we'll say mature enough in order to take on this next uh, level of responsibility in order to reach that next growth. Because ultimately it is, I would say for, for me and my own brands, I would say it, it's part uh, do I feel like, you know, like there's more that I can do on Amazon? Yes. Yeah. Is there more that I can do on any e-commerce? Yes. Um, am I organiz organizationally set up in order to take on uh, other, you know, new uh, sales channels? No, I don't have that in place yet. And that's part of simply just not knowing how to prepare, which I'm sure that your team could probably advise on. Um, the other thing too is doubts as far as things like logistics and sourcing. Yeah. How do I get, you know, uh, not just, you know, things shipped over quickly so I can fulfill uh, via air, but how do I get container ships and how do I plan in advance? So it's something where for me, this is planting the seed of, you know, it's kind of like planning for an exit. You're, you're planning for the next stage in your distribution of the product, your visibility and planning for like, okay, let me write off the last couple of years as being, you know, problematic. <laughs> because yes. of the pandemic, but what, what does the next year look like? What does the next two years look like that I can uh, get some of my ducks in a row and ultimately have a conversation with you and your team? Your team may come back and say, no, you're not ready because you need to get these things in place or you haven't hit this metric. But at least as a brand owner, now I know it's like, oh, I need to make that as part of my annual and my quarterly goals is I need to build up this, this number or my, you know, the, the team that I've got in order to make sure that I am ready to, to launch this into the next, the next stage of life, I guess, for a product and for a brand. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing I'll add to make, again, to make everybody feel better is if, if you decide this is for you and you do find those access points, when you think about what we mentioned earlier around, you know, starting in and around digital and showing that success, something as simple as your expertise in Amazon ads will instantly give you um, not a leg up, but, but certainly kind of a fast track understanding of, of, of running those campaigns. We, we, we run about 50 clients worth of, of campaigns for them uh, on, on Citrus and Critio, different ad tech partners. But, but the ones that I think we, we, we kind of go slow to go fast with are the ones that are like, 
why do I need to spend money on retail media? Why is, is retail search an effective way to drive awareness and engagement? And I think those that are native to Amazon, they, they get it. They, they love the idea that, you know, they can, they can work to gain organic awareness by way of, of running what is, was ultimately very cheap investments. And, and those things on these retailers right now are, are pretty wide open. Um, they are not yet as expensive as what you see in, in both programmatic and, and search on Amazon or even not expensive, certainly as Google or, or Facebook or, or social. And so those that do make it to this deep in the decision journey, um, feel good that you're going to know what to do and you're going to find it to be a lot more cost effective than maybe what you experienced on, on other platforms. And so, again, we always want to leave on, on a good note. That's awesome. So the, um, I, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. that was actually going to be my next question. Yeah. Um, I was going to make a statement and if you could actually share that, that next slide too, please. Yeah. Um, so I was going to say like, before I have you share your contact information, but just leave it up there, please. Yeah. Um, I was going to say like, I'm going to send this out so that those who are in the room currently with us, uh, obviously you'll have to, uh, add to comments or email me if you're catching a replay of this, but if you're in the room now and you want to ask a question, use the raise hand, uh, zoom for some reason is disabled the chat ability. So unfortunately that's not available, but if you want to raise your hand, I can, essentially allow you to turn on your microphone and to speak your question and that way we can get your answer. So I'm going to open it up to uh, open up to everybody who's in the room to go ahead and click on the raise hand button if you've got a question. Um, and then Tom and Jason, if you want to kind of uh, highlight as far as like how best to reach um, you and your team and what to expect on the first conversation. Yeah, I can, I can take that. So yeah, here we have our, um, some of our contact info. And what we do here is this, this email address comes actually directly to the executive team. And then we will, depending on your product category and segment, because we have a deep belief in expertise. So we have BPS sales and teams built out for the categories of which, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, representing each category and, and said retailer. So we can then get you in contact with the right person to kind of evaluate the situation and lead you through a lot of what we discussed today. Very cool. Uh, okay, so it looks like we've got currently we just have one question, which usually says that either uh, they don't want to speak or they, uh, they understood everything that you, <laughs> you came across. So uh, usually people stick around to hear the answers too. I do have a couple of questions. All right. So Peter, I'm going to, I'm going to open up and let you uh, open up your mic so you can speak first. And then Jim, I'll have you go second. Okay. All right. So Peter, let me know if you can, hopefully we can hear you here. Do you want to unmute and speak your question? Hi there. Um, so I would like to ask about, you know, like in general, like how it works out uh, for these brands that they go with the retail for the pricing. Like, uh, what do you see like usually happening is, you know, like the pricing they apply at these uh, retail stores similar to what they would be using on their uh, direct to customer channels or uh, Amazon and other e-commerce channels. So that would be one part of the question. And then the other one was like, uh, when it comes to the fees uh, that they would be charging you, are these somehow comparable to what you would, let's say, expect on like Amazon side or Walmart e-commerce side, um, just to get an idea uh, in terms of margin, how you, you know, how the brands are doing once they go with this retail channels. Yeah, those are great questions, Peter. Uh, Tom and Jason, did you catch both of those? Yeah. Yeah, I can I can go ahead and address uh, first one on expectation of the retail price point. Um, these these omnichannel retailers or big box retailers, they expect to be at parity with your Amazon price. Um, and so the retail, they're, they're going to be pretty passionate about that. They, they will not lose on they don't want to lose on price, just like Amazon doesn't want to lose on price. Um, and so making sure you address a pricing structure that is available for that. And that leads to your second question is what is the margin expectation? Um, it really depends on category, but I would, you know, so each of these retailers have, um, you know, depends again on every category. Some categories can have a category average of 10% margins and some can have averages of 60%, depending on the segment of, uh, of our category that you're within. And these retailers will press to get to at least a category average of what they're in, in that said segment. And oftentimes it does, we, we have found situations where some of these brands that are digitally native can kind of 
can make that work. But there's times where we say, no, this is just way, this is a much higher margin rate than these digital channels that I'm in existing today. And so that becomes, a, that becomes an issue. And depending on how big and prevalent your brand is, the, the bigger you are, the better job, frankly, you've done on Amazon or from a D2C perspective gives us leverage to, to kind of work within that structure because that you might just be that hot of a product that's needed. So it gives us some flexibility to take that margin where it's more palatable um, for you to be able to say yes to one of these retail situations. But it's a, it can be a dynamic conversation, certainly. And Jason, I'd add, um, Peter, again, when you think about your all-in margin as a product owner, you think about all the ways you, you have to invest to be successful. One of those ways that, I, again, I, I'll just always highlight is the amount of money you need to spend to be relevant within kind of Amazon advertising. Most of the time, what we find is, is new and emerging brands, again, that are not very well established or that, that are established um, producers, but yet are not yet established on a retailer. What might be uh, somebody spending thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars a month on Amazon advertising to get their fair share of revenue, they could do the same thing for five thousand um, through target product ads, or kind of eight thousand, obviously through like a Walmart platform. And so, don't quote me on the numbers; quote on the relationships, because you might actually have money annually to play around because some of the supporting ways you have to run the business are, are not nearly as expensive as how they are on Amazon. Cool. All right, Peter, thank you for your questions on that. Uh, Jim, I'm gonna let you uh, come up now. And if you want to uh, unmute, actually you are unmuted, go ahead and fire away. Thanks, Brian. Uh, very good. Uh... And that didn't work, hold on. <laughs> Work for a second. Sorry about that, Jim. I apologize. I hit the wrong button. Brian, you always do this to me. Yeah, I know. I do. That is true, Jim. <laughs> well, first of all, I'll disclose I'm a Minneapolis boy. I have yes. uh, have sold to everybody except uh, Costco and Kohl's. And okay. the discussion is uh, very irrelevant on how to do business with the big boxes. Uh, the, the one thing that I just wanted to ask, it, it seems like Bluebird is, and I go back to first starting uh, to sell to Target back in 1986. And, you know, that was as a manufacturer rep, went through some different phases of my business, got into manufacturing, direct import, uh, did a lot of different things, Target, Walmart. What is the uh, attitude I, I hear with the digital, starting with digital, but going directly into store. When I was selling to Walmart and Target, we did, we did sell uh, digitally, but uh, store placement was really uh, where we went. And our brands, were they national brands? No, uh, what we offered was, quality product priced right, uh, knowing that there is open slots. So really my question is, when you folks evaluate potential brands, are you looking at what is on the shelf and how, if I have a brand that uh, I wanna work with you guys, how would it fit in? So it's kind of like that, What? how much competition are you going up against on a store shelf? Um, Right. Is that being evaluated? That, that, I mean, because we do that on Amazon, obviously. So why wouldn't that be done in the retail space? And I would think that the retailers, and I'll let you, Tom and Jason, to, to uh, answer this correctly. But I would think that the because the retailers are have to scrutinize every inch of the, the, the store shelf that they have, that either you're paying for that space or they're saying, look, this is the one that's actually going to turn over and actually going to move here. So we either allow it or we don't. Correct. Uh, Tom, you want to take this one? I can add in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, Jim, the answer is absolutely yes. I think um, we don't mention digital because we believe that's the only sole focus. We mentioned digital because we believe that's part of the sequence of decisions that are being made right now at these omnichannel retailers. I think what we have done is built actually internal tools that help us 
kind of identify that white space and those gaps in the assortment and so that we actually can make very strong arguments about what you have just mentioned, right? We, we do have a lot of success stories by saying, we believe you have this large price band gap that you know, is making up 20% of this addressable market and we know that, and, and we have a, a solution that fits that mold that is both quality um, and priced right, but, but also has those proof points. And so I would say, Jim, our, our goal is to find kind of less brand partners that you know, maybe are not ready and, and don't fit a solution. Certainly, you know, there's a lot of brands we work with for a lot of reasons, but generally speaking, it's not a winning equation if they are um, kind of lesser quality, duplicative to a dense market and, and maybe priced above where the, the consumer wants. Uh, but absolutely, we are comfortable injecting those type of data points into a sell-in strategy. And, and when we do, uh, we often kind of win that, that space. And so not much has changed um, in that regard since, since you've maybe uh, kind of focused elsewhere. To, to, yeah. to, to double down on that, we are, our team is going to first do a position and understand the shelf understand what the brands are there and we have to convince ourselves by looking at the digital signals and the data sets that we have which are you know how well are you doing in, on your you know on amazon or from a d2c perspective and we have tools that can help share us how that is comparing to your competition in those spaces and oftentimes we're using those digital uh, data points as part of our line reviews to bring into the buyers and kind of thump them over the head with like hey this brand is outperforming the brands you have on shelf like and once we can tell that story through the, the use of data it makes it makes the, the argument much more compelling to for placement so just a follow-up question uh selling to the big boxes uh my experience is always relationships and relationships with the different buyers uh the whole merchandising team uh i assume uh your organization has dedicated people uh, if it's automotive, if it's uh, consumer yep. electronic, whatever department, and they've built those relationships so you can get an audience uh, when the review process starts. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't know, 100% correct. We, we build out business units that are comprised of sales, oftentimes uh, VP of sales, director of sales, and then what we call retail account managers, which are happening more of the operational components of the business. And we give those teams limited divisions for them to kind of focus on or categories for them to, to focus on. And our expectation is that they are going very deep into those, into those categories and segments to be experts within, the, within that space. And again, it goes, they're built around this kind of phrase of earn the right to be heard. Well, how do you do that? You can't be a generalist to everything. You have to have an expertise to, to be credible. Yeah. And, and so I'll, I'll add very quickly. Um, one of the ways that stands the test of time, because we know human nature is to change roles, change functions is we've really worked tirelessly upstream with larger target retail teams. So take the, the, the DMMs and the VPs of the world of categories and, and, and take in a more unbiased analytical approach to educate them on the, on the future of retail, be another data point that they look to around um, education and category development. And so, you know, we, we pride ourselves on that moment when a retail decision maker says, I have a brand that needs some help, you know, work with Bluebird because of the fact that we know they are thinking about business problems the way we are. And so I don't want to diminish the relationships. They're unbelievably important, and, you know, but we do want to go further upstream to make sure that they see us as a trusted advisor, the retailers do. And so we can have not every conversation be about, you know, a box on a shelf and can be more about where are the larger white spaces that you could solve problems for the future. And just, this is the final question. Uh, if a person was doing Amazon only, they kind of know what their inventory flow is. You know, my uh, savings, you better know your cash flow and your inventory flow. And when it comes to selling to the big boxes, uh, you know, I was fortunate for quite a few years of doing uh, DI programs with it. And, you know, that's letter of credits. Uh, it's great business. But then the attitude changed where they said, eh, we want you to now start stocking in the USA. So is your team working with the different retailers 
and with the forecast uh, to give that information back to me saying, okay, uh, they're forecasting X amount of units uh, on a weekly basis. They expect this performance. Uh, orders received on Monday, uh, shipped by Friday. So I would assume that with all your tools and people in house that you can, you know, tell me that uh, I have right now, say, a half million dollars worth of inventory of the SKU, and it works well for Amazon. But if you say land in Target or Walmart, uh, you're going to have to do a big inventory buy, and you're going to have to have inventory available here. Uh, yeah. How does that work with you folks? Yeah, uh, just I think quick quick answer to that, Jim is yes, we 100 percent handle that function. And as I gave that kind of team dynamic, our retail account managers, most of them are former business analysts uh, from say okay. Target or Best Buy or, or, or Walmart in these different cases. So all those operational functions of forecast management, PO management, yes, we are handling that. That's good. Because I think uh, for some Amazon sellers, uh, it, it would be a rude awakening to them. Not They, they have to go eyes wide open because they're going to have to make a uh, pretty substantial investment, especially if they get to the shelf level. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey guys, I apologize. I actually have to have to jump. I unfortunately have a conflict. I think Tom will stay on and, but I've really enjoyed this conversation and, uh, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Appreciate it, Jason. Thank you very much. I, um, thanks, Brian, we did have one me. more question for you, Tom. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I'll go ahead and have you uh, unmute and ask your question. And thank you, Jim. Hey there. Uh, yeah, so quick question. Uh, we, we make like sewn, very sewn products and, uh, you know, it's kind of different packaging than to sell on Amazon versus uh, obviously selling on like a retail shelf. Um, just curious, uh, like before you present a product to a potential uh, retail retailer, uh, would you want the packaging to be retail ready when you show it to them? Or is that something they're usually willing to uh, work with and wait on? Yeah, great question, Ryan. I think the expectation is that it needs to be retail ready once it goes to market. I think we certainly would love to be able to show them how retail ready we are the moment that we get an opportunity to do so. And so I, I do think it de-strengthens the, the, the conversation slightly. But certainly what the, what the buyers and the decision making makers are going to care most about is, do consumers want it? Will it arrive to them protected and as, as assumed ordered? Um, and if that is kind of yet to be fully flushed out, there is a world in which we could, we could likely still present. But, but I think anytime with all of the number of choices that a decision maker has, um, the more you kind of leave them to be forced um, to make a decision without 100% of the facts, I think the less likely they are going to want to engage at this time. Uh, but certainly, I would never want to say absolutely no way would we be able to, um, with the right story, create a go-to-market kind of plan. I just think we would want to be aware that the natural question is, is going to come up and, and how quickly we'll be able to solve that problem. And is that something you guys can help guide brands through is, you know, Correct. obviously like assessing the packaging and um, yeah, I mean, I imagine that's part of what you guys offer. Yeah. And the nice part too, at this point, we've got so much density across so many product categories that, that we have seen it all. And so we can advise, um, form factors, how it's going to sit on a shelf next to everything else, what a buyer is looking for aesthetically as they build the shelf and build a planogram. And so, you know, certainly we've got plenty of expertise and that's why when Jason talks about how we built teams, um, we haven't built teams full of generic retail experts. We, we wanted to find um, groups of people that have very deep expertise in very specific categories. And so that when they're giving you recommendation or they're coaching you through the strategy or they're doing the work for you. And I think that's one of the things I want to make sure is clear is, is we are not consultative um, you know, headcount. We are, we're somebody that's acting as an extension of your business and helping you through all the needs. Um, we want to make sure we're giving you the most specific recommendations we can give you. So absolutely, we will be able to, to guide you through that process. Cool. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for your questions, Ryan.
All right. So, uh, Tom, I really appreciate you and Jason's time today. Um, I will, uh, I don't know if you have any final words, but I was going to simply just say, look, everybody, like if you're at that level where you're curious about how to massively increase your revenue, getting into the retail stores, like the ones that were, were talked about today uh, on a national level, even on a local level, probably, um, I definitely highly encourage you to reach out and just have that initial conversation with Tom or Jason over at the Bluebird Group to find out, are, are you ready now or what do you need to do in order to be ready, you know, a year from now, let's say. Uh, that way you're, you're, you're making plans for the next year um, or even immediately maybe in order to take the next level in your business and, and go omni-channel with it. So Tom, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I just want to say thanks for having us. I would say it's been a pleasure to, to kind of work with the Canopy Group to pull this together. At a minimum, what you'd expect if you reach out, you're going to get contacted with a, a subject matter expert that can kind of work backwards from when these decisions have to be made, do assessment, have some good, good conversations about what it's going to take. And so I think with a quick 30 minute phone call, you're going to find uh, to learn a lot. Um, and we'll make sure it's not a generic inbox email on your back or somebody that can't talk to you about your product category. But the most yeah. importantly, Brian, thank you to you and the rest of the team for having us on. Uh, we look forward to kind of continue to stay connected on this total retail journey and help brands succeed. No question. Yeah. And, and kind of what I opened up with this, this is part of a series that we're doing here at Canopy um, that talks about how to go, how to take your Amazon you know, brand to multi e-commerce channel, as well as, as retail brick and mortar, and even go into new product categories. So what, what I'm trying to do right now is, and of course, Bluebird Group was the first one I brought in on this series. I think it was most relevant as far as going, taking your existing product line and getting out to brick and mortar to the retail market. Uh, but I want you to start thinking outside of the box. Obviously, I'm a huge proponent of the Amazon sales channel with Canopy Management, but I also want to make sure that you are ready to move on to the next level and really expand and take over new market share in new areas that you may not have considered before and including whether that's product lines and categories or off Amazon. So um, definitely my pleasure as well, uh, Tom, as far as having you and Jason here today. Thank you very much for your time and certainly for the added time to answer questions. Absolutely. Thanks again. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic week. You're welcome.